construction. He's very familiar with these planes. Obviously not going to know a lot about this particular crash, but I wanted to bring in Chris Dunn, the chief meteorologist from our Phoenix 12 station. And Chris, thanks for uh, joining us. And um, I know you know a lot about the, the Citation 550 and your pilot yourself. Could you tell like our viewers watching online a little bit about like what, what is going through a pilot's mind when they're taking off and they report engine trouble? What are the, what's the process that they would be going through to maybe get back to the airport or how does that work from a pilot standpoint? Well, thanks for having me on, uh, Brad. Uh, the first process is you want to deal with the emergency and all pilots, no matter the, the skill level or the certification level, you're taught to deal with an engine out, whether it's if you have one or two or four engines on the airplane. So you deal with the emergency and the first rule of any emergency in aviation is fly the airplane. Now, I was looking at some of the observations in that area, and they probably were in the clouds at that point, or maybe not, uh, but pretty close to being in the clouds. So that adds an extra dimension. Not only are you trying to deal with an airplane that may not be functioning properly, but you also have uh, the fact that you can't see outside, which in a normally functioning airplane is perfectly fine. And we're not sure, or at least I have not seen uh, from some of the reports, if they have checked on with air traffic control at that point, because Statesville is a non-tower controlled airport, uh, which is fine. Uh, you just do self announces. But if you're flying IFR or instrument flight rules into the clouds, you are given a release time, you take off, and then you check in with air traffic control. I don't know if they had an opportunity to do just that, but obviously there was some sort of a problem where they took off and they made an immediate left-hand turn coming back to the airport trying to get back on the ground. So if there was some sort of an engine problem or an engine failure, um, the first thing you want to do is secure the engine and try to keep the aircraft under control and then try to get it back down on the ground as, as quickly as possible. So if you lose one engine, obviously this plane can fly with uh, one engine. Um, we heard from another expert that it technically could fly with no engines for a while uh, at altitude, obviously. What, what is the biggest problem with flying with one engine? Let's say one's completely out and you're coming in for landing. What are some of the pitfalls that a, a pilot might have to deal with as they're coming in for an emergency landing, which would this would be, right? Yeah, yeah, certainly uh, it can fly on one engine because it has two. Uh, the biggest uh, challenge, if you will, is uh, something called asymmetrical thrust. So if you think about it, you have two engines, and if you lose one, the other one is going to cause it to yaw or shift over to one side. So you have to account for that. And a lot of the multi-engine training, the curriculum is based on what happens if you do lose an engine uh, and how are you going to treat that emergency? You need to shut down the one inoperative engine and then be able to control the airplane flying on one engine. So uh, there are a lot of procedures that you have to do. And then uh, flying an instrument approach on a single engine in a multi-engine aircraft, uh, that's a big part of training and the recurrent training as well. So there's a lot of emphasis put into that in the, the training environment on operating on just one engine in a multi-engine aircraft. So the, the flight crew, um, don't know if there was one or two. I, I believe the Citation 550 is certified for single pilot operations, but a lot of these operators do operate with two pilots of front. Um, and that just adds an extra layer of safety. Um, we don't know the, exactly the nature of the accident uh, and the crash and the, the, the situation. And of course, uh, in the coming days, we'll find out more. We'll learn more about exactly what happened. But um, typically, flight crews at that level are very well trained to handle a situation like that. But as I said, you have layers of different things that are going on at the same time, and that can make it extra difficult to deal with a situation like that. So, Chris, I mean, they took off. You, you said it's an untowered airport. With Statesville Airport's pretty small for most airport standards, but a lot of, of a commercial, uh, I would say commercial, but um, private jets fly out of there because of the NASCAR teams. Um, would there yeah. be a reason for them to go back to that airport or try to go to another airport? Um, the fact that this happened so quickly, was that just the best place to go um, right after they reported the trouble they had? Yeah, uh, and if they were, uh, their mindset was, we got to get this on the ground right now, we just left a perfectly good airport right behind us. Let's do a U-turn and get right back down on the ground. Uh, 
if uh, they had everything under control and, and things were stabilized, they could uh, declare a May Day and try to get back into uh, Douglas, uh, the, the big airport with a lot more facilities and a lot more emergency response there. But I think their mindset was, we got to get this on the ground. We got to get it on the ground now. We just left an airport behind us. Let's turn back around and get back down on the ground. 